Eddie Chavez. Ruben Nava. And Jesse Romero. Jesus 911. Good morning, everybody. Jesus 911 on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. This is Ruben Nava. My partner, Jesse Romero, is. There he is. He's uh, he's with. I'm us. reporting for duty, sir. Ten eight. Ten eight. Okay, Jess. Hey, Ruben, you're gonna you're gonna uh, you're gonna trip out on this. <laughs> I what? Father Dave Nix was over at my house for the last couple of days. Wow, good. We had a long talk. Long talks. Got to know him really well. And uh, before I took him to the uh, the airport last night, he uh, he uh, prayed the mass for me or celebrated mass for me. The 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 LM. Over at Our Lady of Sorrows in downtown Phoenix, in one of the side chapels, by just him and me and an, and an acolyte, it was the most beautiful experience in my life. Just to mm. just to be there, uh, and it and it, just a beautiful church, mm-hmm. and just to feel just the power of the sacramental graces from the mass washing over me like a tidal wave from a holy priest. So. I had, a, I had a real special time with Father Dave next. Just wanted to wow. throw that out there. Just did you? You're, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the pastor there, or and he, yeah, I, you, I met you, them. You had, yeah, he he introduced them to me. Oh, okay. Yeah, very good. So hey, let's move on to this topic, Ruben. Uh, big topic. We're going to talk about Islam, the Quran, and <clears throat> there's a video that Prager made on Prager University series. Mm-hmm. Now, I got to give a little first a, a little caveat. The Ten Commandments by the Jews in Jewish Bibles, in Catholic Bibles, and in Protestant Bibles, the full text is exactly the same. However, the way we abbreviate or the way we divide them in like little catechisms or in in the abbreviated forms, there's a different abbreviation. And so here Prager, he calls it the Third Commandment. For us as Catholics, we used... St. Augustine is the one that established the the abbreviation for us, and so we would call that the second commandment, the, the, the misuse of God's name. So, again, the full commandments unabbreviated in the Jewish, Catholic, and Protestant Bibles are exactly the same. The way we abbreviate them is different, and I believe that the Catholic way of abbreviate them uh, is, is the proper way, and we could probably do that on another show but uh, there's a good article by Tim Staples on Catholic Answers. It's, it's called, Did the Catholic Church Change the Ten Commandments? Where he goes through oh, why yeah. we abbreviate them the way we do. Yes. And Jimmy Akins also has another article called The Division of the Ten Commandments. And you'll see why we abbreviate them the way we do. And I believe that the Church has the authority to abbreviate them as we have done them. But I want to go on to this video because what Prager's going to argue here is that the worst of all sins in the Bible is is doing evil in God's name. Again, what we would call the second commandment. Yeah. And and he argues something that I've never really heard before, that this is happening every day amongst Muslim terrorists around the world since the time of Muhammad. So I want you to hear this video, then we'll, we'll talk about it, Ruben. Okay. Uh, can you play the clip? Mr. Engineer. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. Is there such a thing as the worst sin, one sin that is worse than all the others? Well, there is. I am well aware that some people differ. They maintain that we can't declare any sin worse than any other. To God, a sin is a sin is how it's often expressed. In this view, a person who steals a stapler from the office is committing as grievous a sin in God's eyes as a murderer. But most people intuitively, as well as biblically, understand that some sins are clearly worse than others. We are confident that God has at least as much common sense as we do. The God of Judaism and Christianity does not equate stealing an office item with murder. So then, what is the worst sin? The worst sin is committing evil in God's name. How do we know? From the third commandment of the Ten Commandments. 
This is the only one of the Ten Commandments that states that God will not forgive a person who violates the commandment. What does the commandment say? It is most commonly translated as, Do not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold guiltless, meaning will not forgive, whoever takes his name in vain. Most people understandably think that the commandment forbids saying God's name for no good reason. So something like, God, that I have a rough day at work today, violates the third commandment. But that interpretation presents a real problem. It would mean that whereas God could forgive the violation of any of the other commandments, dishonoring one's parents, stealing, adultery, or even committing murder, he would never forgive someone who said, God, that I have a rough day at work today. Let's be <laughs> honest. That would render God and the Ten Commandments morally incomprehensible. Well, as it happens, the commandment is not the problem. The problem is the translation. The Hebrew original does not say, do not take. It says, do not carry. The Hebrew literally reads, do not carry the name of the Lord thy God in vain. One of the most widely used new translations of the Bible, the New International Version, or NIV, uses the word misuse rather than the word take. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. This is much closer to the original's intent. What does it mean to carry or to misuse God's name? It means committing evil in God's name, and that God will not forgive. Why not? When an irreligious person commits evil, it doesn't bring God and religion into disrepute. But when religious people commit evil, especially in God's name, they are not only committing evil, they are doing terrible damage to the name of God. In our time, there is an example of this. The evils committed by Islamists who torture, bomb, cut throats, and mass murder, all in the name of God do terrible damage to the name of God. It is not coincidental that what is called the new atheism, the immense eruption of atheist activism, followed the 9-11 attacks on America by Islamist terrorists. In fact, the most frequent argument against God and religion concerns evil committed in God's name, whether it is done in the name of Allah today or was done in the past in the name of Christ. People who murder in the name of God not only kill their victims, they kill God too. That's why the greatest sin is religious evil. That's what the third commandment is there to teach. Don't carry God's name in vain. If you do, God won't forgive you. Yeah, there you have it. So, uh, in our second commandment, the Jews' third commandment, um, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord that God in vain, it commands us to have reverence in speaking about God and holy things and keeping oaths and vows, and it, it forbids blasphemy and uh, irreverent use of God's name, speaking disrespectfully of holy things and false oaths, false oath, oaths and breaking of vows. So, I mean, I know a lot about taking oaths. I was in the courtroom a good portion of my career taking oaths and... Uh, you know, you, you raise your hand and you say, you know, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And uh, I, uh, after my uh, reversion back to the faith, Jess, I used to look up to God, uh, to the heavens and say, uh, it's, you know, do you, um, I'm, I'm in the courtroom. Yeah, in the courtroom, I would just say, yeah, uh, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So I would look up and say, so help me God, I do. Most people would just say, I do. And I would look up and I would invoke God's name. So help me God, I do. And um, you know, because I, I bet you got a few comments I where did. people turned their head. I bet I did. And uh, I know the the jury when sometimes we'd have uh, after the, the, the trial, the, the prosecutor will typically um, pull the jury to see what was it that caught, you know, that got their attention that what what was it that caused the uh, the verdict to go in our favor and a lot of them said well you know that detective he he was credible and, and you know that he he took his oath serious i just throw that out there just because we we're not supposed to take false oaths man we're we're invoking god's name it makes a difference that's yep. good ruben because you brought it down to a micro level for catholics but the the thing that pra prager's making is something that i never heard before because 
Muslims call God Allah, and uh, Allah just simply means God in Arabic. So you have like Arabic Christians, you know, Orthodox and Catholics. They call they call God Allah as well because yeah. it's just that's, that's their language. So whenever, like for example, a Muslim terrorist has a bomb in his waist and goes into a pizza parlor with a bunch of Jews and says Allah Akbar and blows himself up. That's what Prager's talking about there. They're actually taking God's name, Allah, the Arabic version of God's name, and they're doing something horrendously evil in God's name. And that's that's what he's saying that in their interpretation, the Jewish interpretation, he says the word is actually do not misuse or, or carry God's name in vain. And when somebody does something evil in the name of God, he says that's the height of evil. And really, you know, the first commandment is the worst of all the ten. I mean, that's even Catholic teaching. That's Catholic theology. Uh, that's why during the Mass, we, we confess, uh, we, we, during the penitential rite, you say, uh, you confess all my sins, that, uh, what I've done, what I, uh, in thought, word, and deed, what I've done, and what I failed to do. In other words, the thought, word, and deed that you're confessing are the things that you've done to offend God in the first commandment. So that penitential rite is a first commandment offense that you're confessing right there and asking God to forgive you because God is offended by your thoughts, by your words, and with your deeds. And when you break the first commandment, it slip, it, 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 it's easily, it's easy to break the other nine because the first one is the linchpin. Yeah. All right. We'll be right back. We'll talk some more about this uh, this Prager video and and about Islam. You don't want to miss this talk. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is Jesse Romero. Join me on a pilgrimage of faith and discovery to Poland for the 100th year anniversary of the birth of St. John Paul II in May of 2020. Together we'll experience the faith, beauty, and culture of Poland and become imbibed with the spirit of John Paul II. We'll visit the town of Wadowice, where John Paul was born, and the city of Krakow, where he was ordained and later became bishop. We'll also travel to Jasnogora and visit Our Lady of Czestochowa, and we'll have a chance to venerate the original image of the merciful Jesus at St. Faustina's convent and the city that St. Maximilian Kolbe built for the Immaculata. Finally, we'll pay a visit to Auschwitz, where St. Maximilian Kolbe was martyred. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to worship and discover your own faith at places where St. John Paul II grew in his own love for our Lord. For more information or how to join this pilgrimage, visit my website at jesseromero.com. Jesus said in Luke 17, When you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have only done our duty. According to St. John of the Cross, God is pleased with the little deeds we do in secret. He takes more pleasure in these than in a multitude of grand works that we may do out of the desire to be seen by others. May God help us to do the things that please Him and not just to appear great in the eyes of others. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888 526 2151. Jesus 911, two man car. We are 10 8, open for calls, and we are reporting for duty. Right. Jess, we're talking about the uh, what. Well, Prager was talking about on this last, uh, we give you a, a little clip of his uh, 
this talk on what the worst sin is, and he's he's saying it's taking the the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And, and, and even worse than that, Ruben, it's, it's doing evil in God's name. Doing that's right. Yeah, doing people e- that do evil in God's name. I'll give you another one, not just to pick on Muslims. Uh, a, a priest that does uh, that participates in a black mass. Oh yeah, and that's been known to happen. Yep. Okay. Uh, that that's the height of evil because we're the true religion, Reuben, and a priest is God's servant. So that that's taking God's name in vain. So there's a, a, a lot of examples, but Islam does it like every day. Yeah. Ever since uh, the start of that religion back in the seventh century. And I don't know how many people I've talked to that they they get turned off by religion because oh, all these wars have occurred in God's name. You know. And they, obviously, they're not aware of you know of the causes. They they just see they the talk about it. They don't do any studying themselves. But right, you know, uh, when we're talking, yeah, the fact yeah. the facts are is that more when you look at the history of wars, more wars have been fought uh, and, and instigated by secularist, theistic, communist, godless regimes yep. than Christian wars by far. I mean. It's like it's like uh, fifty to one. I mean, so if anybody wants to just go and, and you can just do a search on the internet and look at religious wars versus secular wars, you'll see how many people have died as a result of secular wars. You know, just basic human greed and power, and we want to take over your country. We want your, you know, we want your gold and your women. Mm-hmm. That's happened far, far more, or uh, in, in far lo- uh, larger. Uh, numbers than than uh, than uh religious wars yeah and you know um saint thomas he, he talking about this commandment he uh he, he goes so far as to say it's an insult to god because when you swear by god it is nothing other than to call him to witness and when you swear falsely you either believe wow. god to be ignorant of the truth and thus place ignorance in god whereas all things are naked and open to his eyes or you think that god loves a lie whereas he hates it Thou will destroy all thy, that people that speak a lie, um, or wow. or again you detract from his power as if he were able to punish the lie. That's about as strong uh, as strong as a, an indictment as you can get. Yeah, and so, why this sin is dangerous, Ruben. I want to move on on now to this article called "Will the Quran Be Your Child's Next Textbook?" I don't have to worry about it. My kids are grown up. I do got grandkids coming up. Uh, and uh, I don't know how things are here in uh, in Arizona because I haven't vetted the schools yet. That's my kids' job to start doing that since they're going to. But here's what the article says: Modern Mohammedans, that's Muslims, are using American schools to make Islam more acceptable to Christians everywhere. The pattern of that attempt is spelled out in two separate articles, appearing within a week of each other. One article is called "The Islamization of Public Education Continues Apace." And that's by a Catholic priest that appeared on Crisis Magazine. The other one came on LifeSite News. It's called Muslim Nations Are Donating Huge Amounts to American Universities. Here's Why by William Kirkpatrick. And these two articles written by Catholics reveal the extent of the Muslim influence in American education today. Wow. So Father said in his article with Crisis, he, he relates the story of Kaylee Wood, a Christian student in the 11th grade at at La Plata High School in Maryland, she complained that her grade was affected when she refused to repeat, quote, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, close quote. She wouldn't do that. So what happened? Well, she was kicked out of the school or suspended, uh, and uh, her family ended up suing, and in this inexplicable decision, the 4th District Court of Appeals found that this coercion by the school did not violate Mrs. Wood's constitutional rights. And so the decision stands because uh, the U.S. Supreme Court declined to hear the case. So essentially, the 4th District Court of Appeals sided with the public school that there's nothing wrong wow. with making non-Muslim students repeat uh, that Muslim prayer, which is called the Shahada. Uh, that's that's like their 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 creed. Yeah. You know, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. This is unbelievable. unbelievable. Yeah. This is why I, I'm glad that President Trump is uh, stacking the deck with uh, conservative justices and, and a lot of these lower courts. Because Ruben, we got to change uh, the tenor of this country. Oh, absolutely, Jesse. They're they're just 
catering to political correctness, you know. Uh, but what would they have said if if uh, the teacher had made them do the Apostles' Creed, you know? How far would that have gotten? You know, maybe the first line and then they'd be shut down. It, there's no way. But they're allowing this to happen. And it's, you know, it, these these kids, and God bless this, this young lady that she knew, uh, she was obviously Christian, that she knew enough to, uh, to say no to it. You know, we can't, we can't be doing that. It, she had courage too, Ruben, because imagine in a classroom yeah. with all your peers and everybody just caving in and just saying the Shahada, you know, <laughs> there's only one God and all is his servant and stuff. And she just, when it came to her, she just said, no, I'm not going to do it. Good that, what, what tells me is a, that she was fairly well formed yep. in her, in her faith and at least rooted in Christ, uh, where she's going to, where she basically said, I'm not going to deny Jesus. This is this is a false religion. He's a false prophet. That's right. So uh, I, I give a lot of credit to her and her family. Somebody raised her right. Yeah. Hey, the article goes on to say that um, Mr. Kilpatrick's story was a far broader context, that Muslim countries are acquiring influence by making massive donations to many universities in the United States. And you know how we always say we follow the money. This is yep. what's going on. That article cites a study by the Clarion Institute that documents those gifts, a staggering $10.6 billion that with a B was given since 2012. And Clarion asserts that this is just the tip of the iceberg. The International Institute of Islamic Thought, for example, funnels additional more money into universities. However, it does not have to report the disbursements because it is based in the United States. You know, that was they're from out of country. So I, I and I have no doubt that they're funneling money to the Democratic Party. And that's why they they're like um they back everything that the uh, is Mohammedans Anything do. Anything to destroy Western civilization, which is based on Christianity, wow. Islam will fund to destroy. Ruben, yep. You you got the money of 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 Islamic, uh, you know, big oil. You got George Soros. Anything to destroy Western civilization, which was given to us by the Catholic Church, Catholic ethic, uh, you know, Catholic, uh, you know, social teaching. All the greatness of the West is from Catholicism, and we have some serious money trying to destroy it. Absolutely. So uh, the, the, the motivation of Islamic countries for these donations make them stand out. And um, the Muslim nations openly promote their religious beliefs. Indeed, you know, the, the article says that in, the Quran commands them to do so. For example, when it says in 860, Muslims must muster all weapons to terrorize the infidels. Their growing influence in U.S. and European academic centers is now a preferred weapon. So there it is. Chapter 8, verse 60. Muslims must muster all weapons to terrorize the infidels. In case you don't know what an infidel is, that's us. it means a non-Muslim. That's what it means in, in, in their religion. A non-Muslim. That's you and I. That's a Jew. Yep. That's a secular humanist. That's a Buddhist. Anybody who's not a Muslim is an infidel. What else does the article say, Ruben? The funded programs in these schools embrace the Muslim view, while any idea that smacks of Christianity is rejected. Just what I, I mentioned. The Muslims have purchased that influence with cold, hard cash. They know that ideas on college campuses trickle down to elementary and secondary education. That's and right. some, someday the better students in, the, in their programs will, will grow to become makers and influencers of U.S. government policy. You know what I call this, Ruben? I call this jihad by infiltration. Yeah. Hey, jihad means holy war. And how are they doing this holy war? By politics, by hard cash, cold money, and by, and by infiltration. Yeah. This is how they're going to do it. I mean, we already have uh, a few uh, radical Muslims that are congresswomen right now. Right. They're yeah. inside. There's a few that are governors, you know, and they're quiet, but they've put place, they've, they've sworn an oath on the Quran. Yeah. And, and the, to swear an oath on the Quran, 860, you just quoted it. It, it impels Muslims to muster all weapons to terrorize infidels. So, yeah, put on a suit and tie, become a politician, whatever it takes to implement jihad in the West. And their uh, their goal is to is to institute Sharia law. So that that's a problem. It's a, a big problem. And, and, you know, thank God that uh, uh, President Trump, uh, he kind of uh, took the immigration that was that we, through the last administration. Uh, Obama was just allowing a great number of people, um, Muslim immigration in from Syria, some of these war-torn countries, exactly. you know, and uh, Yemen and, and, and all these other countries that where they, they've been radicalized. And so 
you know, now we're we're doing a better job at vetting them. And well, a lot better. Yeah. Wow. So much better. The article says, Ruben, here, <clears throat> the general attitude was succinctly stated by Palestinian-American activist Linda Sarsour mm. when she said, quote, our number one and top priority is to protect and defend our Muslim community. It's not to assimilate, and she means to um, assimilate to America. Right. It is not to assimilate and please any other people and authority, close quote. So when Linda Sarsour says, quote, protect and defend, she's not using the words in the context of peaceful coexistence because Linda Sarsour knows full well that the Quran chapter 3, verse 28, says the following, quote, Muslims must not take the infidels as friends, close quote. Mm. And here's a huge example of the infiltration. Mr. Kilpatrick cites the example of a Middle East Studies program financed to the tune of $235,000 by the small but wealthy nation of Qatar. It is, jo- it is run jointly by the University of North Carolina and Duke University. Mm. And the pro-Muslim biases of this program and these colleges, they were so blatant that the U.S. Department of Education sent them an official letter charging them with failing to provide a balance of perspectives. And according to this letter by the Department of Education, the positive aspects of Islam were emphasized, but there was no similar attention to the positive aspects of Christianity, Judaism, or any other religion or belief or belief system in the Middle East. And get this, mm. while the $235,000 might seem relatively small in the whole scheme of things, the administrators at Duke University and UNC have reason to hope for better things. In other words, more money. Why? Because Qatar has also donated, don't fall off your chair, $351 million to Jesuit-run Georgetown University, the first and oldest Catholic university in the United States. If this isn't a complete takeover of the Catholic Jesuit system by Islam, I don't know what is, Ruben. Is this mic on, Jess? Holy moly, that $351 million. Uh, yeah, I think Georgetown. Um, I've known that for years that they're they're Catholic in name only, and that's it. You know, they're what a disgrace it is. What a disgrace to the Catholic faith. That president of that university is a disgrace to the Catholic faith. Those Absolutely. professors who have compromised on the theology department are a disgrace to the Catholic faith. That's an open apostasy right there. Yep, I agree. All right, we'll continue with more of this uh, this article. When we come back, stay tuned. We got Ernesto from Long Beach. You know, I just wanted to comment. You know, and I just wanted to thank you guys. And I kind of wanted to encourage people that are listening, maybe that are not donating, you know, because honestly, I got to be honest. I used to think you guys were a little too over the top, time, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. You That's know, right. If God gave us a lot, you know, and I'm, I have the blessing of listening to all this. And I just want to call all the people, you know, I've got five kids, you know, and I don't make a lot of money and I'm still donating to you guys. God because bless you, I, brother. You're amazing. We got to We have to do this. We have to do the extra. And it's not even the extra. People see it like it's extra. Kneeling for communion, saying your rosary, saying the divine mercy chaplet. It is not extra. It's what the church tells us to do. Amen. We, You're a good man, brother. 30 years old, 30 years old 29 years old five kids and i thank you guys for everybody else man get on fire fight for the truth man i know what i'm telling you guys there's i no love it out there This is Terry Barber reminding you, there's a women's conference coming up September 7th, 2019 at the Sacred Heart Chapel. Mary Danielle Barber will be speaking along with Barbara Nicolosi. They're going to be talking.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Jesus 911, we are back to Matt Carr. We are talking about Islam and what uh, what they're doing to infiltrate our, our school system. All and the money, they're doing a good job of it, too. They are. And, you know, what? Through, through immigration, too, Jess. I mean, yeah. it's, it's not like... Through- yeah, I yeah. talked to a Muslim who's a convert to the Catholic faith. He said he used to teach in Baghdad. He was a professor. He says okay. uh, the, the strategy he goes, we teach. Uh, I used to teach for 20 years. It's called jihad through immigra- immigration. Yeah, You know, just saturate a country with a lot of Muslims, and you make little little enclaves, what we would call barrios or ghettos, of, of, of Muslims, and they basically run everything, the gas stations, the stores, everything, where even the police department and first responders are afraid to go in there. Right. Uh, they call those no go zones, and so he goes. And also another thing that that he says we want to do is just have more babies than uh, than other religions. So that's kind of our fault in that regard, Ruben. In the West, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, we've dropped the ball on that area, uh, and especially in the Catholic Church. I mean, in Europe, the average uh, Catholic family has one. In Europe, this is this is mother. This is headquarters. Well, uh, one child per family. So this is an area where Islam is. Uh, is advancing in, in, in spades. And there, um, you know, we, we talked about the uh, what Georgetown uh, University did, but how about the uh, the congresswoman, um, Omar? Uh, she, she she spoke at a Catholic church with the permission, Recently, right? With this on the East Coast. Uh, I can't recall what, what uh, where it was exactly. Microphone but, on. Yeah, she, she was preaching the Quran in a Catholic church. Unbelievable, you know? Um, wow. <laughs> and it, the Catholics, uh, I mean, way back when, when um, Pope John Paul II, he he offered the uh, a parcel of land right near the Vatican for. It, it turned out, I believe, at the time, it was the second largest mosque ever built right there. Huge mistake. Why, why are we allowing this? You know, just the um, you know, the, the when I'm we talk, Ruben, because there's there's this false notion of ecumenism. Yeah, that's okay? it. Yeah, we we forgot our history as Catholics. We we've forgotten the Crusades. We've forgotten the 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 violent streak in this in this religion. And here's what I think we've done is we've wanted ever since Vatican took the end of Vatican II, we wanted to find another approach yeah. for ecumenism. Well, guess what? This other approach is going to have our throats slit. How about the Inquisition? And was it when you read read it from a secular point of view? Oh, it was a horrible thing. But in reality. These people were stealing, you know, the souls of, of you know, of uh, Catholics. And right. so, so what, what's worse, killing the body or killing the soul? You know, so, according to Jesus, Jesus says killing the soul's worse. Absolutely. So, yeah, it's, it wasn't all bad when you read about the Inquisition. I mean, I'm not purporting that we start we start whacking people if they're not believing how we believe. But, you know, some we, we can't just you know, assimilate these religions into these false religions into our neighborhoods and our schools. So our children are, you know, they're, they don't know any better and and, and they're going to be misled. Yeah. Ruben, because they're, they're trying to, the inquisition has used courts that were set up to try to uh, f- find or ferret out these false converts the, that were trying to infiltrate the Catholic church that were saying they were Catholic, but they were false conversions to try to infiltrate. So again, you know, the church, uh, uh, was there abuses by some people? Of course, there's always going to be abuses when you have human beings in human courts. But the fact of the matter is, the intentions were were good to ferret out uh, the infiltrators and the false conversions. They call them the false conversos into the Catholic faith. Yes. I, and what the, all the word inquisition means is people act like it's a big, like, you know, boogeyman word. All it means is to inquire yeah. or to ask. <laughs> That's all it means. Like, if I ask you a question, I just gave you an inquisition. Yeah. I asked you a question. Right. Wow. You know, what a, what a, what a real uh, diabolical word, huh? Yeah. 
Uh, did you, you you may have been reading the in what was the Inquirer? It was uh, those, those those tabloid magazines that you did you get at the checkout counter? The Inquirer. Uh, yeah, it just it means to, it means to ask. That's all it means. Okay, yep. f- let's finish up with this um, this yep. story here. In Newton, Massachusetts, parents discovered in 2011 that a textbook used by ninth graders called the Arab World Studies Notebook was telling pupils over the fa- over the past four decades, women have been active in the Palestinian resistance movement. So several hundred have been imprisoned, tortured, and killed by Israeli occupation forces. The Newton parents discovered worse. History teachers were receiving training workshops from prominent anti-Israel critics including a leader of the BDS, the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions Movement campaign. And, you know, that's why um, uh, the Jews are being persecuted once again. You know, anti-Semitism is back on the rise. It's, yeah. And this is, Ruben, and this happening? is nothing but revisionist history and anti-Semitic propaganda that they're using, trying to, uh, trying to you know, clothe it with academia. Mm. That's all it is. Yeah. Okay? And they're just like today— Academia tries to clothe liberalism and progressive thought and moral relativism, you know, with nice, uh, you know, ten dollar words. Same thing here. Yeah. And there's another story right here in this article about a uh, a retired history teacher who went to a workshop, and it was put on by uh, uh, hosted by two Muslim men, and they were talking about the great the great contributions of, of the Muslim world to, uh, I guess, to just to the world at large. So this history teacher is listening to this presentation <laughs> and the history teacher hears them say, you know, here says for most of this one sided presentation, the other participants and I were silent as the teacher enthusiastically, the Muslim teacher promoted the role of a, the, of Islam's accomplishments. Mm. Not having studied the history of the Islamic world, I did not believe that I had the facts at hand to challenge her, but the tenor of her talk irritated me. She sounded like a telemarketer, but I could not hang up. So then she went on into the triumphs of medieval Islamic medicine, concluding with the statement that, quote, European hospitals were where were, were people went to die, close quote. Finally, this retired history teacher was familiar with this argument or this part of history because uh, he had recently taught it, uh, you know, before he retired. And so he basically stood up and he says... Uh, that uh, that's nonsense. I blurted out, that's nonsense. <laughs> it, it was Catholic hospitals where they were doing brain surgery in medieval Europe. And apparently these, these Muslim uh, you know, presenters, they were not expecting somebody to challenge their lecture. And so they kind of lost their rhythm. And within about five minutes, they closed down their presentation and their lecture. Well, they're good, for, good him. for him. Yeah. He stood up and said, hey, this is wrong. This is not true. And all of a sudden, they closed shop. Mm. Imagine that. Well, it sounded a lot like this presentation was was taken right out of the book of uh, President Obama when he was going up there on, and he started ranting about uh, what the Muslims have done for for this country, the founding of this country. He was over and over again. He was, you know, uh, giving revision, pro- propping them up. Yeah, propping them up, and uh, we're like, whoa, wait a but second. But it's false history, but it's just not true. I know. <laughs> but you know, people uh, yeah, believe in not, it. it. It's not true. This revision is history about Islam. Yeah, so uh, this this guy who who spoke up, he says perhaps I should have been more courteous. However, the incident does not does show that Islamic propaganda efforts can be resisted. Many American educators have been cowed or convinced to take the side of the Muslim world through ignorance or avarice. You know, that's the greed. Money, uh, money. The warning based upon history is our culture must rise and defend itself. It's not enough that Muslims have relatively little political power in the U.S., Recent events in France point out the danger inherent in ignoring the cultural inroads made by Muslims and Muslim nations. And he says that the fact that some Muslims do live peacefully in the United States does not refute this point. Historically, majority votes do not cause social change. They occur when a relatively small group marshals their resources to focus on a clear goal. And he says Western culture faces just such a situation today. Our children's future may hinge on meeting it courageously, and you know we, we don't uh, we don't take note of this. Man, we could be seeing some serious problems. You know, the Pew Research says that in by 2040, Muslims will replace Jews as the nation's largest religious group after Christians. 
And by 2015, the U.S. Muslim population is projected to reach 8.1 million or 2.1 percent of the nation's total population, nearly twice the share of today. So you know they're going to be uh, speaking out more. There's, there's Ruben, more you already of them. see with very very limited Muslims in this country, they're already taking political offices po- offices of power, and you can see what a few Muslims in Congress and, and as governors or as senators, you could see the effect they're having just on the entire Democrat mm-hmm. Party. Correct. Now here's my take on Islam. Okay, I think Islam is a it's a fake religion. Let, let me let me back up what I say before people fall off their chair. Okay. Okay. I don't deny that it's a religion, but I believe that Islam is a Trojan horse. Okay, think about that, that, that the Iliad, okay? Yeah. The Trojan horse uh, that had soldiers in there, it was, it was uh, given as a gift over to the Greeks, and they went and slit their throats when everybody was asleep. All the soldiers came up from the belly of the horse. This is what Islam is. It's a Trojan horse. What I mean by this is it, it, it's got the, 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 the outside appearances of religion— but in its in its fullest form, Islam it's it's an a hundred it's an a hundred percent way of life. In other words, it has a religious component, it has a legal component, it has a political component, it has an economic component, oil, the political care, and and other uh, propagandists, uh, you know, Linda Sarsour. Uh, it's got a social component, and it's got a military component. So Islam is like, think about, uh, you know, it's like uh, a hand. It's got five fingers. Okay. Islam, there's different fingers in Islam that make up the hand. And this is what makes it dangerous, Ruben, because they'll use their political, they'll use their military components to advance the religion. See, religion, faith is supposed to be advanced by reason. By 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 sharing, by being thoughtful, by by a thoughtful witness, by a thoughtful presentation, by the witness of your life, religion is not supposed to be advanced by a military might or by political or economics, uh, you know, you know, uh, shenanigans. And that's what Islam is doing right now. Yeah, that's right, Jess. And um, so. We'll, we'll give you a prime example now in the next, uh, what we're going to Well, they're impacting about the Latino community big time yeah. right now. That embarrasses me, Ruben. Yeah. That's embarrassing. Well, we're, you're going to want to hear this. This uh, A lot of uh, Catholics are converting to Islam, and so uh, that's that's troubling. All right. 10, 1033, right? <laughs> We'd be saying 1033. We need help. Give me the patch. All right. Be right back. <laughs> Don't change that dial. Welcome to our January 11, 2020 Spiritual Warfare Conference. Every year without fail, this is our most popular event. This year's Spiritual Warfare Conference will host Adam Bly, a Catholic demonologist and auxiliary member of the International Association of Exorcists, along with Dr. Luis Sandoval, a psychiatrist who's part of the Healing, Deliverance, and Exorcism team for the Diocese of Orange. These two gentlemen bring tons of experience and expertise in the area of spiritual warfare. This is going to be a high-information Catholic seminar I'll be there as well, sharing some riveting stories on the diabolical and liberation found through Jesus Christ from my best-selling book, The Devil in the City of Angels. Mark your calendars, come and join us, and meet other radio hosts from Jesus 911. Contrary to popular belief, spiritual warfare is not demon-centered. It's Christ-centered. Come join us and learn how to armor up and fight the good fight of faith. Catholics, wake up. Don't hit the snooze button. Join us at St. Christopher Catholic Church, 629 South Glendora Avenue, West Covina, California, on January 11, 2020. See you then. Strength and honor in Jesus' name. This is Terry Barber. I want to thank you for supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And here's an easy way to support us, by going to smile.amazon.com and type in Catholic Resource Center or Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And when you log in your Amazon account and you purchase products, a portion of it will go right back in supporting Virgin Most Powerful Radio. And it doesn't cost you a dime. I want to thank you ahead of time because that supports us year-round. May God bless you and your family. 
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites the Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Jesus 911, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. We're talking about Islam and then the infiltration. Um, we, we, we're going into a, this kind of troubling article where more Latinos in the U.S. are leaving the Catholic Church for Islam. Uh, so... Uh, this article is uh, based in New Jersey, Union City, and it uh, it talks about, it's from uh, USA Today, but it says, you, uh, Luis Lopez battled nerves as he walked to the front of the crowded prayer hall in Union City with his son. Together, they repeated word for word in Arabic, the Shahada, we talked about earlier, the profession of faith required to convert to Islam. And, and uh, they say, quote, there's no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, end quote. They declared at the mosque located in a columned brick building that once housed the Cuban Community Center. So for Lopez, he, you know, his conversion and embraced by the, by the con- congregation four months ago brought a feeling of peace and recognition of how far he'd come from a life that nearly ended 22 years ago in gang violence. He said, they told, they told me, come to the mosque, you're going to be feel welcomed. It said Lopez, he's 41, a truck driver and former professional boxer from North Bergen. And he also he joined it with his 21 year old son, um, and it's it's a growing segment of the Latino population who are leaving Christianity for Islam, and about eight percent it says here of all Muslim Americans adults are Latino according to 2017 report from the Pew Research Center, increasing by about a third from 2011. That's troubling, Jess. A- absolutely, yeah. Ruben. That's uh, to me, I'm scratching my head because. Well, let's just be honest. You know who, you know who they're going after. They're going after. They prey on the low information Catholics. Okay. Yeah. They're preying on the low inform the, the unchurched Catholics, who have probably gone through hard times, uh, and and they 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 prey on the low hanging fruit. And let's just be honest. That's most Catholics mm-hmm. after Vatican II, are 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 easy pickings for the cults and for false religions. And, uh, the, and and I'll tell you probably why, especially this this appeals to men. Now, I don't know why Islam would appeal to women. I'm still scratching my head. Yeah. But I know why it would appeal to men, because, again, it's a very it's a very patriarchal religion where uh, women are second class citizens. There's all kinds of, uh, you know, the, the, all kinds of sexual benefits, the carnal benefits. Let's just be honest. Yeah. You know, you got uh, you're allowed to marry four wives and and have a girlfriend at the same time. Uh, you know, women uh basically there's it's a master slave relationship. It's not an equal relationship like in Christianity. The wife and the husband they're ontologically equal before God. I mean, there's a there's obviously a a a difference in 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 roles in Christianity, but in Islam there's a fundamental difference ontologically. They're not the same. It's a master slave relationship relationship mm-hmm. and uh yeah. I don't know how this appeals to women. I see how it appeals to men. But this, uh, it just tells, Ruben, as I read this article, it tells me that our efforts to evangelize and catechize the average Catholic have been pathetically failing since Vatican II. They have. Yeah. It just it hasn't, it hasn't worked. And then you've got the liberal modernists in the church that hate apologetics. I mean, apologetics is something that kind of became a little bit, uh, it, it became, uh, it started probably in the early 80s, and now there's a big movement post-Vatican II of, 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 of uh, Catholic apologetics. Yeah. But uh, I'll be honest with you, the U.S. bishops have never got behind it. It's, it's, these are lay-run movements to try to teach other Catholics how to defend their faith against false religions and the cults. But this is something that the institutional church has never gotten behind. In fact, they, 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 uh, they criticize apologetics. Well, how, they, say it's, they, they say it's pre-Vatican II, it's antiquated. How about the Holy Father when he says we're not supposed to be proselytizing? And that, 
I can't, you know, these other religions are proselytizing and, and they're taking them, our, our Catholics away and, uh, you know, taking them to their demise in this, you know, and we, we've got to fight back in a sense, because these are, our, these are our brothers and sisters in Christ who were once coming home to the Eucharist, coming home to mass. And, and they're no longer doing that. They're, it, it, they're follow, following a false religion, you know, they're a false understanding of God. So that's, uh, you know, I, we talked about the commandments in the beginning. You're breaking the first commandment right there. That's it. And and we have a missionary mandate. We ha- Jesus Christ told us what Jesus says exceeds what any pope says. He says, go out there and make disciples of all nations, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The word proselytize, I'm looking at it here, the dictionary.com. It says, to convert or attempt to convert as a proselyte or recruit. Now, the only thing that I would agree on is we don't beat anybody right. to convert to the Catholic faith. I would agree with that. Uh, there, there should never be any force used, like we're going to beat you up and kick your butt mm-hmm. unless you convert to the Catholic faith. But as Catholics, the appeal to reason, the appeal to faith, the appeal to sound argumentation, historical historical facts, uh, the appeal to the to the uniqueness of Jesus Christ saving work on Calvary. Absolutely. All that's fair game. And because I'll, I'll, but I'll tell you why it's hard to convert the Muslim Ruben is because the Muslim has the closed mind. And what I mean by that, they've, they've basically committed intellectual suicide because the advantage that we have as Catholics is that Catholicism functions using faith and reason kind of, there's a, an analogy given by a Pope the Catholic faith is like a dove with two wings. One wing is faith, one wing is reason. And so the dove can fly straight because it has those two wings. Mm-hmm. Islam rejects reason. In fact, they had their own little their own little gathering, like their own little synod or council back in the tenth century, where all the, the Muslim scholars were taking a look at Islam as as a, and, and possibly to reform it. So you had the the faith and reason side of Islam, the faith, the Quran and reason. Then you had the other sign that was reason, that was Quran alone. Well, guess what? Uh, in the 10th century, the Quran alone, Muslim scholars, they won the day. They, they, they won the argument. So basically from the 10th century forward, Islam has divorced uh, reason from the Quran. Mm-hmm. And so this is the crisis in Islam right now. They, they appeal to the Quran alone. So this is this is why the Muslim mind is closed. If you can't make your argument from the Quran alone, mm-hmm. and the danger of the Quran alone view is that there's 164 violent verses in the Quran. Uh, uh, is this microphone on? <laughs> I've told Muslims, I said, find me one violent verse in the New Testament, and I'll leave the Catholic faith. Show me one verse where our Lord or an apostle tells us to go kill, physically beat a non-Christian. Show me one verse in the 27 books of the New Testament, and I'll leave the Catholic faith. I've been asking them for 15 years. Guess what? Crickets. Yep. Can't hear But it's all over their book, Ruben. And this is the difficulty why, and this is why Pope Benedict XVI back in 2006, he, he was talking about Islam. He says, religion, talking about Islam, religion without reason leads to fanaticism. Mm, that's right. They don't have that personal relationship with their God. You know, th- no. they, they don't, they're not aware of that. The story of the prodigal son, you know, where uh, the merciful God, you know, he, he's just a uh, foreign to them. Yeah, excellent. Absolutely. And you know uh, what the article says here, it just is that they're the Latinos and Muslims. They're feel, they feel targeted. They're being targeted by president Donald Trump, his rhetoric and, and increasingly restrictive immigration policies for both groups. So uh, they're joining forces in essence, you know, they say reports of hate crimes are on the rise while Muslims bristle against their depiction in the media. Yet for some, the shared experience of living as a minority in the U.S. is a powerful attraction. So they they're just, they're getting some uh, they're, they don't have a false understanding of, of what, you know, uh, immigration and what the faith, what we've talked about on other shows, you know, what St. Thomas talks about immigration, you know, and this. So for for them to think that 
you know, the, the president is targeting them. You know, he's he's trying to keep our country safe. I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not a Trump apologist, but uh, he's he's our best uh, he's our best candidate to uh, to to keep uh, Western civilization, you know, our values. In my lifetime. Going. Yeah. 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 So. Uh, yeah, so these 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 Mexicans, uh, is, uh, Puerto Ricans, uh, along in the East Coast. This article is coming from uh, New Jersey, and they're they're saying that the, they're finding that the faith is easier to pick up. You know, this the, it's it's easier. Well, I think off the air, Jesse and I, we were, we were talking about how we have made it complicated in the Catholic faith. You know, we we've got a, a catechism that. You know, it, nobody reads Ruben. It's 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 it, about two inches thick, yeah. eight font. Yeah, but the Baltimore Catechism will do just fine. You know, let's it's just, about let's uh, three quarters that. of an inch thick, and it's big letters yeah. and it's questions and answers. Yep, that's the blue collar catechism. Yep, well, it's just fine. We should just keep that keep that going. Now, Ruben, I'll tell you what's the you know, I'll tell you what the problem with the Quran is. Think about this. I mean, it was the Quran. Or it, it's the lectures or the messages given supposedly by Allah to Muhammad. So so this is and this is what Muhammad said. He couldn't read or, he couldn't read or write. He was illiterate. So it was his scribes that wrote everything that Muhammad said. So Muhammad basically over a 23 year period from 61080 to 632 AD, he would say things and he would say this is what God told me. And then his scribes, his secretaries would just write it. So so basically the Quran are the sayings of one man that we're supposed to believe who was illiterate, uneducated, a womanizer, had a six-year-old wife. What do you call that? You call that a child molester. Yeah. Uh, he was a warlord. He was constantly fighting wars. He had harems. He had sex slaves. And we're supposed to believe, I mean, the fruits of his life are awful. We're supposed to believe that he was God's messenger and everything he says there in 23 years that was written down by his secretaries, we're supposed to believe. You know what? I'm uh, not brain dead. I'm not. I'm not buying it, Jess. I'm not buying it. <laughs> so, you know, we, we've got to do a better job of of living the faith, and uh, so so that these people will see that and and teach people as we go along. You know, we teach them by by the fruits of our lives. You know, and and let them see that in us and. Uh, but we've done a poor job in the last 50 years, and our church leaders uh, have uh, to take some credit for that. And, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, Ruben, you know what? This is a, a Lepanto moment, like 1571. This is, And so what do we got to do? Let's trust in God like those crusaders did. Let's pray our rosaries. Let's, uh, let's uh, invoke the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary to help us and our church right now and our leaders. Amen. Because just like the odds were against the Catholics back in 1571... They prayed the rosary. They trusted in God. And Our Lady gave them the victory. And what? guess what? She can give us the victory because we're on the winning side. God's not dead. He's not even tired. That's right. And, you know, if they want to wear the hijab, why don't they come to the traditional Latin Mass? They can wear their there you scarves, go. right? <laughs> Eso. As my dad used to say, Eso. rest in peace. Yes. <laughs> All right. You've been listening to Jesus 911. Two-man car here today. And we were, uh, we're blessed to have you with us. And uh, stay tuned for Gary Mishuda on Hands-On Apologetics in the dojo. We'll see you tomorrow. God bless. Keep the faith. St. Faustina's Prayer for Priests Oh, my Jesus, I beg thee on behalf of the whole church, grant it love and the light of thy spirit, and give power to the words of priests, so that hardened hearts might be brought to repentance and return to thee, O Lord. Lord, give us holy priests. Thou thyself maintain them in holiness. O divine and great high priest, may the power of thy mercy accompany them everywhere and protect them from the devil's traps and snares which are continually being set for the souls of priests. May the power of thy mercy, O Lord, shatter and bring to naught all that might tarnish the sanctity of priests. For thou canst do all things. Amen. Virgin Most Powerful, pray for us.